Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to another edition of Crimes of the Week International. Representatives from the Police Service of Northern Ireland say that a couple of their officers were left speechless this week after they drove home an intoxicated woman, only to discover minutes later that she had gotten behind the wheel almost immediately afterwards and caused a crash. The whole thing began sometime in the early morning hours of June 2nd, when the PSNI officers in question were on patrol in the town of Portadown. They were driving along when they spotted a woman who was clearly drunk and walking alone. Concerned for her safety, they offered her a ride home, making sure that she got into her house before heading back out. It seemed like a job well done until about 15 minutes later when the officers were called about a vehicle collision in the same area. When they arrived at the scene, they were stunned to find the same woman that they had just dropped off slumped over the wheel of a white BMW. Evidently, after being dropped at home, the woman had decided to go out for a late-night drive and had almost immediately slammed into another car. The woman, who has not been identified by name at the time of this recording, was given a breathalyzer test where she unsurprisingly blew over three times above the legal limit for alcohol. Thankfully, no one was hurt as a result of the crash, though the woman was arrested and is now awaiting charges. In a post to social media this week, PSNI representatives wrote in part, quote, We cannot stress the message enough. Never, ever drink and drive, or this could be the consequences of your actions. If you ever find yourself in a position where you are considering getting behind the wheel of a car after a few drinks, think about this. Could you live with the guilt if you seriously hurt or kill someone else using the road? Representatives from Ecuador's National Police say that a pair of brothers are in custody this week after they allegedly kidnapped their own father for ransom, but were foiled after one of the victims at the scene managed to escape. The whole thing took place sometime on the afternoon of June 1st, when the father in question, identified as Victor Manuel M., was at his livestock farm in the town of Las Moras, about 100 miles north of the port city of Guayaquil. The man, who was in his 80s, was preparing to have lunch with his nephew Robin and a worker identified as Jeremy B., when suddenly things took a startling turn. The men were ambushed by five armed attackers wearing hoods who threatened them and told them to get down on the ground. Initially, the victims complied, but taking advantage of the confusion while the culprits began tying them up, Robin managed to slip away into some bushes on the property. He remained hidden there until a police patrol car passed by, at which point he alerted officers about what was going on. When police pulled up to the property, they were reportedly met by three men. Those men have since been identified as Victor's two sons, Daniel and Victor Jr., as well as their childhood friend, Jonathan Joel B. The men apparently told officers that nothing was wrong, and when questioned about the location of Daniel and Victor Jr.'s father, said that he had been put in a nursing home. However, as police started to look around a bit, they found evidence backing up what Robin had told them. This reportedly included a truck that the men had been driving that had concealed license plates on it, as well as a damaged video camera on the property. During further searches, officers found victim and Jeremy, who had been tied up and were being kept in a warehouse on the property. Upon being rescued, Victor immediately identified his two sons as being responsible for what had happened to him. He said that they had kidnapped him and were planning to demand a $10,000 U.S. ransom for his release. Daniel, Victor Jr., and Jonathan were all arrested and currently remain in custody. It's unclear if police have yet found their additional alleged accomplices or if they are still searching for them at this time. Authorities in the English county of Essex say that they are investigating a disturbing and tragic case this week after a man allegedly murdered his wife and her adult son inside their own home. The situation began at around 9.50 p.m. on May 28th when police were called to an address on Cambridge Road in the small village of Ugly with reports that two people had been seriously injured. They arrived at the property to find 54-year-old Maria Nugara and her 29-year-old son, Giuseppe Moriale. Sadly, both were pronounced dead at the scene. So far, shockingly little has been released about the case, even more than a week later at the time of this recording. 
Maria and Giuseppe's causes of death have not been disclosed, nor has any kind of motive behind the crime. What we do know, though, is that Maria's husband, 63-year-old Calagero Ricotta, was arrested not long after the discovery of her and Giuseppe's bodies. Ricotta has now been charged with two counts of murder and one count of actual bodily harm. Following the announcement of the charges, Maria and Giuseppe's family members released a statement mourning their loss. They say that the mother and son were very close, describing Maria as always smiling and having a positive outlook on life, while Giuseppe was described as having a loving heart and always looking out for those close to him. The investigation continues. Authorities in Western Australia say that a man has been charged in connection with a horrifying case of domestic violence this week after he allegedly murdered his own mother in a brutal attack that not only left a quiet neighborhood shaken, but was apparently also witnessed by a young girl. According to reports, the awful crime unfolded just after 7 p.m. on June 2nd, when police began receiving triple zero emergency calls from residents in the Perth suburb of Byford. Multiple people said that they had heard a woman screaming on Gallipoli Avenue, with one caller stating that they had been alerted by a 12-year-old girl who told them that the woman was under attack and that the situation had started in a nearby residence she had been in. When officers arrived, they found the victim, later identified as 61-year-old Yvette Verney, lying outside of a residence there. Sadly, she was quickly pronounced dead. Disturbingly, blood evidence was reportedly recovered from multiple properties, showing how Yvette had run from her home on Larimar Parade while desperately trying to get help. Not long after responding to the scene, police learned that Yvette's son, 33-year-old Harley James Jeffries, was the person allegedly responsible for the fatal attack. He was witnessed fleeing the scene immediately afterwards in a silver vehicle. Jeffries was spotted driving about two hours later while traveling along the Great Northern Highway near the town of Bindoon. Police attempted to initiate a traffic stop, however the 33-year-old apparently refused to pull over. He was followed for about another 60 miles before tire deflating devices were successfully deployed in the town of Bindi Bindi. Even after the vehicle was immobilized, Jeffries was aggressive with police. Officers ended up using tasers on him before he was finally placed under arrest. At the time of this recording, the case is still under investigation, and the details of the actual murder remain murky. It's not clear how Yvette was killed or what motivated the savage attack. It also hasn't been revealed whether the 12-year-old witness was related to the victim and suspect. Currently, Jeffries remains in custody and has been charged with murder. Authorities in the Chinese city of Shanghai say that they were able to solve a burglary case in record time recently after the alleged culprit made the bizarre choice to leave behind a note at the crime scene that included his contact information. According to reports, the whole thing started sometime on the morning of May 17th when employees at a building in the city's Pudong New Area arrived at work to find that they had been the victims of a crime. Someone had broken into their offices and some equipment as well as other items was clearly missing. When police were called to the scene, things quickly took a strange turn when they found a notebook that didn't belong to any of the workers. It had been left on a desk with several computers stacked on top of it. Upon looking in the notebook, officers were met with quite the surprise. Inside was a message that had been left behind by the perpetrator. It read in part, quote, Hello boss, you need to improve your security. The culprit had gone on to write that they had stolen a watch, a computer, and other valuables. However, they claimed that they only really wanted cash and were willing to give the items back for the right price. At the bottom of the letter was a number to call in case the victims were interested. Apparently, the burglar really didn't think this through, though, because it seems he used his actual number, not a burner phone. Using this, as well as surveillance footage from the crime scene that allegedly showed the suspect scaling a wall on the property, police were able to identify him as a man by the last name of Sang. Sang was arrested that same day by 2.30 p.m. All of the stolen items were recovered, and Sang now remains in custody on suspicion of theft. (music) 
Authorities in Thailand say that more than 16 years on the run recently came to an end for a foolhardy fugitive after he posted a message on social media mocking police and daring them to find him. The case began all the way back on April 10, 2008, when the suspect, identified only by the name Wudachai, got into an argument with another customer while hanging out at a bar on the island of Phuket. That argument quickly escalated, ending with Wudachai allegedly stabbing the other man before fleeing the scene. Thankfully, the victim survived his injuries and was able to give police a bunch of information leading to Wudachai's identification. An arrest warrant was issued for him nearly two weeks later, however, by that point, he had gone on the run. For over 16 years, Wudachai managed to evade capture, largely by moving around and changing jobs frequently. Of course, it's likely that police also just didn't devote that many resources to catching him, you know, since he wasn't exactly a high-profile criminal. Despite this, Wudachai apparently convinced himself that he was invincible, and that no matter what, authorities would be unable to find him. This unbridled hubris is presumably what caused him to recently post a message to Facebook, taunting police and even giving away details of his location. That message read in part, quote, Which cop dares to arrest someone like me? I've been wanted since 2007. No cop is brave enough. I'm in Takun. Come if you can. As you might imagine, this was a pretty big miscalculation on Wudachai's part, who was arrested not long after this message was posted. He was taken into custody on June 1st, after police found him working at a fruit purchasing shop. Following his capture, it seems that the now 35-year-old considerably reeled in his bravado. He claimed that the stabbing that he was wanted for was actually self-defense, and that he had been drunk at the time. He also said that his taunting Facebook post was just for show, and that he actually didn't believe that police would come and arrest him. At the time of this recording, Wudachai is awaiting extradition back to Phuket, where he will face formal charges. Authorities in the Indian state of Uttar Pradesh released a major update in a months-long investigation this week, announcing that they had charged five people in connection with a truly wild case, in which a woman and her lover allegedly stole and cremated a body in order to frame her parents for a fake murder. The whole thing started back on January 2nd, 2024, when police in Etawa were called about a death near some railway tracks in the Friends Colony area of the city. They arrived to find the body of a man who appeared to have been hit by a train. The man's body was transported to a local morgue, after which authorities began circulating photos of him on social media to aid in his identification. It seemed like they were in luck when on January 4th, two people showed up to claim the body. They identified themselves as Dindayal and Abhi Kumar and said that the deceased man was Dindayal's 26-year-old son, Atul. After filling out some paperwork and providing contact information, the body was released to Dindayal and Abhi. However, things were about to get a whole lot stranger. On January 7th, Workers at the morgue were surprised when another man came in asking about the same body that had been recovered from the railway tracks. The man, Dharamvir Rajput, said that he had seen photos police posted online and recognized the man as his brother, Satyavir. To the horror of the morgue workers, they soon realized that they had made a huge mistake. It turned out that the body really was Satyavir's. When they went back to the information provided by the other two people who had claimed the remains, they discovered that the documents had been forged and that the contact details they had provided were fake. Using CCTV footage and other undisclosed evidence, police were ultimately led to five people in connection with the stolen remains. They have since been identified as Maskan Koshta, Hetra Matal, Mode Farkan, Mode Taslim, and Mode Farouk. During questioning and subsequent investigation, authorities discovered the twisted reason why the suspects had wanted the body. According to reports released by police this week, Muscon and Hetram had been in a relationship for between four to five years, despite the fact that Hetram was married. He wanted to leave his wife and marry Muscon, but her parents wouldn't allow it, so they allegedly came up with an elaborate plan. First, they had Muscon pretend to get engaged to a man named Atul Kumar, who they allegedly created false identity documents for. 
They then started searching local police reports and morgues looking for unidentified bodies until they had stumbled across Satyavir. After fraudulently claiming his remains, they had him cremated, with their plan being to pass his remains off as those of Muskan's imaginary fiancé. The final phase of the scheme was to make it seem like the fake fiancé had been murdered by Muskan's parents. With them in prison, Muskan and Hetram apparently figured no one would be standing in their way and that they could be together. It's unclear exactly what the three accomplices did, though according to police, two of them posed as the fake fiancé's relatives and went to the morgue to collect the body. While police managed to unravel the wild plot before Muskan and Hetram could frame Muskan's parents for murder, unfortunately by the time they were caught, they had already cremated Satyavir's body. In their announcement this week, police stated that all five suspects have been arrested and are being charged under the Gangsters Act which is the state's legislation targeting organized crime. Reports don't mention exactly what offenses they are facing, though several local sources state that forgery is likely among the charges. Authorities in the Brazilian city of Rio de Janeiro say that they are on the hunt for a woman this week after she allegedly planned and carried out the murder of her boyfriend, whose body was found under disturbing circumstances late last month. The whole thing began on May 20th, when police were called by several tenants of an apartment complex in Rio's Angeno Novo neighborhood. Residents were complaining of a foul odor that seemed to be emanating from a particular unit inside the building. When officers arrived, they quickly discovered the awful reason behind the stench. Upon entering the unit, they found a man's body in an advanced state of decomposition. The body was wrapped in sheets and blankets and had been left on a living room couch. The man was quickly identified as the resident of the apartment, businessman Luis Marcelo Antonio Ormond. It was immediately clear to police that whoever had left Luis like this had wanted his body to remain undiscovered for as long as possible. Two fans had been placed close to the remains and were on full blast pointing towards an open window in an obvious attempt to cover up the smell. Using other evidence found at the crime scene, authorities began to come up with a theory as to what had happened. There were empty packets of a morphine-based drug in the apartment, and it looked like Louise had sustained a blow to the head. Detectives therefore speculated that the businessman had been poisoned and that the head wound might have been inflicted once he was incapacitated. Even more chilling evidence was uncovered when authorities took a look at surveillance video in the apartment complex, particularly footage that had been recorded in the building's elevators. The footage led them to their prime suspect, Luis's girlfriend, Julia Andrade Caramo Pimenta. When Julia was brought in for an interview on May 22nd, she claimed to know nothing about Luis's death. Though she had been living with him at his apartment for the previous month, she stated that she had left sometime early on May 20th after she and Luis had an argument the night before. She stated that when she left, Luis seemed fine. Of course, based on the state of decomposition Louise's body was found in, investigators knew this couldn't be true. He had to have been dead for at least several days before his remains were discovered. From reviewing the surveillance footage at the apartment building, police knew that Louise was last seen alive on May 17th. In a video of him taken in the elevator that day, he is accompanied by Julia. At first, the footage looks fairly innocuous. The couple exchange a small kiss at one point, Louise can be seen eating a chocolate, and they seem to be in conversation. However, as the video goes on, Louise starts to exhibit troubling signs. He coughs, closes his eyes, and appears to be out of sorts. At one point, he pulls at the door of the elevator before telling Julia that he doesn't feel well. While this was the last time that Louise was captured on video, Julia could be seen on the building's surveillance cameras for three or four days afterwards going on with her life as if nothing had happened. During their conversation with her, police found Julia to be remarkably unconcerned about her boyfriend's death. She laughed and smiled throughout the interview and didn't appear at all troubled about what had happened. Unfortunately, though, at this point, authorities felt they didn't have enough specific evidence against her, so they were forced to let her go. That changed just a short time later when investigators received the results of Louise's autopsy. Traces of chocolate had been found in his system, along with the morphine-based drug found in his apartment. Police concluded that Julia had poisoned the chocolate and given it to Louise, then had finished him off after they made it back inside the apartment. 
An arrest warrant was obtained for Julia, however by that point she had disappeared. The case took another turn when police were able to track down Louise's car, computer, and several other personal items which were missing from his residence. They were reportedly in the possession of a woman named Suyani Breschak. After being arrested, Suyani told police that she was Julia's spiritual mentor and that she had been coming to her regularly for years. In fact, Siani said that Julia had so frequently sought her services that she had racked up a debt equivalent to over $110,000 US. On top of this, Julia was also giving her so-called mentor the equivalent of about $1,000 USD a month. Siani claimed that she had been given Louise's car and other personal items to help pay off part of that debt. Police, however, now say that they believe Suyani was just as involved in Louise's murder as Julia was, and that the women planned the crime together. Believe it or not, the whole thing still gets crazier from here. Apparently, police suspect that Julia was never in a legitimate relationship with Louise, and that she had picked him out as a mark from the very beginning to steal his money and assets. According to some local news sources, after moving in with Louise, she had almost immediately started pressuring him to get married and wanted him to put her name as the beneficiary for funds from a land sale deal he had recently made. This was all while Julia apparently had another boyfriend and was also working as an escort on the side. Neither of the boyfriends apparently knew about each other or her escort work. At the time of this recording, Julia remains on the run, though police say that they think she might be hiding out somewhere in Rio de Janeiro's Lagos region. The situation is still developing. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a second to give a huge shout out to everyone who has made it this far into the video. Seriously, thank you so much for watching. If you found today's upload interesting and informative, we'd be honored if you consider liking and subscribing, as well as hitting the notification bell and selecting all notifications to stay up to date with our latest releases. If you're looking for additional ways to help support the channel, we'd love to have you join us over on Patreon. Patrons get ad-free and early access to all of our content, as well as four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. You can learn more at patreon.com slash crimezone, where you'll also find some of the fine folks whose names are currently on screen. All that being said, we understand that not everyone has the means to support financially, and that's totally okay. We appreciate every like, sub, share, and comment that you send our way. Once again, thanks so much everyone, and take care.